Thank you. Can you hear me back there? Is this better? This one? Well, can you hear me if I talk like this? Okay. My name is Mary, and I am an alcoholic. And this is a... I'm just real happy to be here tonight, and it's also a very special day. It's not my AA birthday, but it is my natural birthday. (laughs) When I first started talking in AA, I used to tell everybody my true age over a loudspeaker. And a man walked up to me one night, and he said, Honey... We stress the honesty part of this program, but you don't have to be that honest. And then Antoinette told me she had always heard any woman that would tell her true age would tell anything. So I just leave that out of my my little statistics that I give. And before I begin my talk, I want to tell you about my medallions I'm wearing. This is my gold medallion that my sponsor, Willie B. of Spring, Texas, gave me on my 30th AA birthday two years ago. (laughs) It has the state of Texas on it in gold, and across the top it says, Sobriety Born in Texas, and that's right. And Willie's been my sponsor the last 14 years because one of my sponsors moved out of the state and one of my sponsors died. And even though I had been sober 18 years, I felt like I needed a backup sponsor, so I asked Willie. And I think she talked up here a couple of years ago. Now, I'm wearing this little, I've been wearing this bronze medallion, and there's a little story attached to this. Did any of you ever see the best little whorehouse in Texas, starring Burt Reynolds and Dolly Parton. Surely y'all heard of that. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and anyway, there. This is a true story. And there was a famous whorehouse at Lagrange, Texas, called the Chicken Ranch, and it had been in business over a hundred years. And uh, a TV personality in Houston accused the sheriff down there of taking a bribe to keep the chicken ranch open. And I'm pretty sure this sheriff took bribes either in trade or money. (laughs) You know, that old boy had a bird's nest on the ground, didn't he? (laughs) And anyway, in all the publicity that ensued, they had to close the chicken ranch. Now, I have heard that there are some people in Texas that thought the chicken ranch should be turned into an historical monument. I have also heard that grown men cried when they closed the chicken ranch. Also some wives. I've had my beads, they came on, I've had my beads for several months and worn them a couple of times, and I looked down one day and I saw a chicken and a rooster engraved on my bronze medallion. And when I read what was on my medallion, I burst out into laughter, because on one side of my medallion it says the chicken ranch, LaGrange, Texas, and on the other side it says, good for all night. (laughs) <laughs> oh, let's see where I was. I got it all engrossed in my talk, in my story. Um, oh, I know. I was. Uh, oh, I have been sober since April the twenty-first of nineteen sixty-four. One day at a time, and. Uh,
this miracle of sobriety, this amazing grace, is because of a divine and loving providence, my two beloved sponsors, Gloria and Lee H., and because of the loving fellowship of people exactly like you. I grew up in the West Texas town called Breckenridge, and it's deep in the heart of Texas. And I am a born and bred Texan with this wonderful Texas twang. And my mother and father were the social leaders of the church, of the Baptist church in this little town, and they entertained a lot. They were also in politics. And, uh, but uh, they didn't serve alcohol, and they didn't drink alcohol, but they weren't for it and they weren't against it. And my little friend's parents at the country club said, drank alcohol and served alcohol, and it was just all right. And I grew up in my formative years thinking alcohol was a beverage. And good God, the good Lord knows, it ain't no Perrier water and it ain't no soda pop. It is a mood altering chemical formula and it was so toxic to me, it almost cost me my life. Now, I just love the marrying kinds in AA, and there are some. There was a man back in Houston had been sober a long time, had already been married 11 times. And I sponsor a woman that recently married for her ninth time. And I heard about a man in West Virginia that said he had jars of peanut butter that lasted longer than some of his marriages. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how, I, I'll never know the joys I might have missed because I was married to the same husband all of my life, one day at a time. And he recently died. He died on October the 6th, 1996. And uh, so I had kind of have to change my story around a little bit. And I'm the mother of two grown sons. And I thank God every day they're grown and raised. And I am a grandmother, but I, I ain't the babysitting kind of grandmother. And I belong to an old and honorable profession. I am a housewife. Now, I am not a member of the oldest profession. <laughs> and it's a damn good thing. Consider my mean personality and how ugly I was. I would have starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> I took my first drink when I was a senior in high school, and it ended in complete disaster. I got drunk, I got sick, I started throwing up on everybody just like a flamethrower, and they were scurrying to get out of my way. And this was such a bad trip for me that I didn't drink anything for the next, about the next 10 years. And in that 10 years, I had married. I was the mother of these two small sons. We were buying a new used home and a new used car all on one salary, and there wasn't enough money left over to have help with my housework. And I had an awful lot of housework to do, and I hated housework. You know, Irma Bombeck says, housework, if it's done right, can kill you. <laughs> but I felt... <laughs> I felt about housework like this little hippie bride. She told her best friend, she said, oh, housework is such a drag. She said, you wash the dishes and make up the beds, and three weeks later you have to do it all over again. <laughs> One afternoon I was trying to wade through a big ironing, and back in those days, you had to iron everything but the socks and the underwear. And Alice Jane, a friend, came by and suggested a cold beer. Well, when I drank that cold beer that hot, humid afternoon in Houston, alcohol did something for me. 
first of all, it made me feel like a million dollars, and it also gave me energy. And on two beers, I got through that big ironing, and I had dinner ready, started, and everything, and I thought, boy, I have found the answer. Because you could buy six ice-cold bottles of beer back in those days for a dollar. That's cheaper than a maid any time. And I could afford a dollar. And um, so it, I didn't know it, but that's when my alcoholism kicked in was that afternoon. And I started drinking two to four beers a day to get through my housework, four to six beers a day, six to eight beers a day. I had the cleanest house in Houston. I even put newspapers under the cuckoo clock. When I got up to eight to ten beers a day, that's when I decided I'd switch to bourbon. And with two, within two years after drinking that beer that afternoon, I was in serious trouble with my alcoholism, only I didn't know that's what it was. And this is when I started experiencing a personality change. Did any of you ever have a personality change when you drank? Well, my personality change was so dangerous and so bizarre. Now, I can't stress that bad enough that my family had to take the firing pins out of all the guns in the house. Incidentally, I have a nickname. I'm called Shotgun. <laughs> and uh, now, in the beginning, what they, when they would accuse me or they would criticize me or they would... Uh, Anyway, if they, 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 whatever they did to make me mad, if they made me mad, I would grab a gun and I would try to shoot them. And I am described perfectly in the big book, in my big book, it's the 55 edition, on page 21 in three sentences. It says, the alcoholic does the absurd, incredible, and tragic things while drinking. He is the regular Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He, now, this describes me. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. He is always more or less insanely drunk. Now, my family called my rages, my, they called them my spells. So when they could tell that I was going into a spell, they would hide the guns from me. But I could always find them. Then they got to where they locked up all the ammunition from me out in the pump house under a great big lock. And they had me fall for a while. But one morning I got up and got my husband off to work and these two boys off to school. Now, I think the youngest one was still in kindergarten. And as soon as I got them gone, I sat down in this old antique rocker in my living room and I was watching the clock on the mantel. When it got straight up nine o'clock, I was going to the liquor store, which took 15 minutes. Now, many a morning I had gotten to the liquor store before it opened, <laughs> and I would be standing out there with those winos and those weirdos, and this was humiliating to me. But if I waited till 9 o'clock, I could walk in that liquor store like a lady and buy my two or three half pints of Old Crow <laughs> at 9 o'clock, 9.15 in the morning. And while I was rocking in the rocking chair, I remembered how mean they had been to me the night before, especially my husband. He had gotten me mad and aggravated me, and then he locked up all the ammunition and I couldn't shoot him. <laughs> and I thought, I know just what I'll do. I'll stop back by the hardware store and I'll buy my own ammunition, which I did. And I didn't buy ordinary shells. I bought hollow points. I know, I know. Now, this is ammunition that is not designed or to wound or to wing. It is designed to devastate. 
And this loving wife and mother came home from the liquor store and the hardware store with several boxes of devastating ammunition. But I knew what my family would do just as soon as they, if they discovered what I had done. So I took all, took, I started hiding these shells all over the house, 15 or 20 upstairs and downstairs and under the stairs and every place I could think to hide some shells, I hid some. And, you know, after I had outsmarted an alcoholic husband and two small sons, I felt real smug. And nothing uneventful happened for several months because I didn't always get out of control. I didn't always go into one of my spells. And, uh, but one afternoon, usually, usually what would happen, I would either get drunk and love everybody, or I would start drinking and I'd be industrious, or I'd start drinking and I would just peacefully pass out. But it, nothing serious happened. But um, now I'm just losing my place right there. And you know what? I've been freezing to death all day, all day ever since I've been here, and now it's just as warm up here as it could be. <laughs> And I was determined to wear my red silk dress, and somebody suggested I put on some long handles, and I didn't bring those with me. <laughs> oh, dear. I'll just, just bear with me. It'll take me just a minute. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. Anyway, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just pick up where I think I left off. I, <laughs> But you know, in my insanity, when I felt threatened, uh, I felt like they were the enemy. And many a morning I have gotten up to fix breakfast for my family, and I didn't all, I'm just all mixed up here, but that's all right. I don't have to be perfect up here. But when I, when I felt threatened after they had locked, oh, I know where I was. I'm glad this happened. I know now where I was. Uh, it came back to me. So nothing uneventful happened for several months, and then one day my husband and my two sons were out in the backyard, and they were pitching horseshoes, and they were having such a good time out there, and I was in the house drinking my husband's beer. He's a beer alcoholic, and I, then I'd go in my bedroom, and I'd take two or three slugs of old crow, then I'd come back and chase it with his beer. And I want you to know that I drank so much Old Crow before I got to this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that is exactly what I looked like 33 years ago. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just glad I didn't drink Old Granddad. <laughs> or Wild Turkey. <laughs> My, my husband came in to get a beer. The icebox was full of his beer. He came in to get a beer, and he took one look at me, and he says, Mary, how in the hell can you be so drunk on two beers? <laughs> I looked up at him so innocent, I said, I don't know. <laughs> it must be my metabolism. <laughs> and it was my metabolism, and it was drunk. Well, when he went outside to finish up the horseshoe game, I thought they were having too much fun out there, and I decided I'd shake them up a little bit. So I got the 22 automatic rifle, which I had won in a poker game one night when I was drunk. And I started loading this, this 22 automatic rifle when I got it all loaded. I went out on the back porch and I just fired into the ground two or three times and I did shake them up a little bit. <laughs> you never saw a covey of quail scatter the way my loved ones did, just whoo. You know, one went east and one went west and one went over the cuckoo's nest. And they were catcalling back in the fourth. What in the world had happened? I double-crossed them again. And they came to two conclusions. The first conclusion, that gun was loaded. And the second conclusion was, so was I. 
So it was after this they started taking the firing pins out of all the guns in the house. It was a matter of necessity and safety. But after this, when I felt threatened, and in my insanity I would feel threatened, I would revert to the butcher knives and the meat cleavers and the ice picks. There is a convention speaker I talk with, and he always announces, if he, if he talks before me, he says, when Mary gets through talking, every man in this room is going to feel grateful. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the most insidious phases of this disease of alcoholism is that we turn against those that we love and need the most. And I can well identify with Kenny last night or any other man in this room that had gotten drunk and abused his wife and children. But uh, many a morning I have gotten up to fix breakfast for my family and I'd open the knife drawer and there wouldn't be a knife, an ice pick, a beer opener, or anything in that drawer with a point or an edge on it. And my heart would just sink. And I would make that long, slow walk down to my son's bedroom never knowing what I was going to find. But I remember when I checked them out and they had all their ears and their noses, oh, I was so grateful that they were all right. But when I have found these knives and this great big old meat cleaver up under their pillows, I would know I had just been dreadful the night before. And I'd take a knife out from the pillow to walk to the kitchen so I could fix breakfast. And I walked to my kitchen with the heaviest heart and the sickest soul of any woman you will ever know. And I'd put this knife in the sink and run some water over it. And all, I had a window over my kitchen sink. And always about this time the sun was rising. And I would look out through the trees to the sunrise and I would say, if there is a God, he has to be in the sunrise. And I'd say, my God, my God, I have done it again. What is the matter with me? I didn't know I had a disease called alcoholism that was causing this insane behavior. And this, the perplexity of my behavior and my remorse and guilt brought on the suicide attempts. And I tried to commit suicide. Often it got to be old hat around our house. On one suicide attempt, I had to spend eight days in the hospital. But you know, I knew the law of averages was going to catch up with me, and I didn't want to die. I just didn't want to live this sick way I was living. This is when I made a decision that I would go to the doctor and find out what was wrong with me. And this was the beginning of my prescription phase of my alcoholism. And before it was over, I took energizers, stabilizers, tranquilizers, barbiturates, and a lot of narcotics. I took the whole drug spectrum. And it wasn't odd at all for the druggist to call me and say, Mrs. Moncris, there is a new prescription on the market, and I thought perhaps it might help you. And I'd say, well, Mr. Black, you just send it out. Now, I never smoked pot. I never snorted cocaine. And I never uh, used heroin for three reasons only. That's the medical profession, the pharmaceutical companies, and the liquor industry. With these three organizations going for me, I didn't need anything else to get me through the day. And this... Uh, This doctor was interviewing me, and I told him, I said, I drink nearly every day, and I get drunk nearly every day. I might even be an alcoholic. And he looked across his desk and smiled at me, and he said, nonsense. A nice little woman like you couldn't be an alcoholic. I agreed with him 100%. <laughs> And he ran a whole battery of tests on me. And when my liver function test came back okay, he came. He said, see, you couldn't be an alcoholic. All alcoholics have liver damage, bad liver. I didn't even have bad, livers when I, bad liver when I came back in 12, 15 years later. 
and uh, but he was worried about my suicide attempts which he attributed to depression well I don't know about you but I was depressed every time I had a hangover which was every time I drank and uh, I came home from this doctor's office with a clean bill of health weighing 90 pounds dripping wet oh I forgot he put me on the amphetamine drug which is the which is the, the pet pill You've had some of those, I can tell. And, <laughs> <laughs> now, this is medication that if it's, it's wonderful if it's used right. It is used for depression, and it's also used in weight loss. What it does, it jazzes up your thyroid, gives you a lot of energy and pep vim, and it depresses the appetite centers in your brain. So you uh, jazz around a lot, do a lot of work and everything, and don't eat, ergo, you will lose weight. But if you abuse these amphetamines the way I did, you will also lose some of your marbles. <laughs> and I came home from this doctor's office, weighing 90 pounds, dripping wet, in a great big bottle of reducing medicine. But I still remember, I, Within 30 minutes after taking that first amphetamine, my God, I thought I had been reborn. Oh, it was a wonderful feeling. I felt good. I felt happy, joyous, and free. <laughs> and when, when my husband came in from work that night, the boys met him at the back door, and they said, Oh, Daddy, Mother feels good. And once again, I thought, I have found an answer. But this wonderful, oh, he also put me on a weekly series of vitamin and hormone shots. And, but this wonderful medication had a bad drawback to it. I was so exhilarated and happy, I couldn't sleep. And after not sleeping two or three nights, I called the doctor about this. And his first words were, well, we sure do want you to sleep. So he sent me my first prescription for the sleeping tablets. So I was getting up in the morning and taking my pet pill in the morning and the sleeping tablets at night. And this went along for two or three weeks and the icebox is full of beer and I'm still alcoholic and I reach in there and I start drinking and I start losing control and I call the doctor about this and it seems there is a brand new drug on the market called a tranquilizer. And he sent me a prescription, and the bottle had the magic words on there, take as needed. <laughs> <laughs> so I was getting up in the morning, taking the pep pill, the tranquilizer through the day, and the sleeping tablet at night. And uh, I, I thought I was doing pretty good. But the icebox is still full of beer, and I'm still alcoholic. And it is as normal for me to drink, as for an alcoholic to drink, as it is for me to breathe. And I reached in there and started drinking. Now, I had been going every week and getting my vitamin and hormone shots. And when I started mixing alcohol with all of this medication, it was taking a dreadful toll of me. My naturally curly hair became limp and stringy. I've always been a little cross-eyed, and back in those days I went around with one eye closed. I uh, had a green cast to my complexion with undertones of yellow. I had lost five pounds on my reducing medicine. And if this isn't bad enough, skinny, cross-eyed, and green, I was growing fine fuzz on each side of my face. <laughs> and a prominent mustache across my upper lip. Now, I don't know how long I had looked this way. <laughs> but if I had been growing horns and a tail, <laughs> My family would not have said a word to me. <laughs> they wouldn't want to do anything to upset mother. <laughs> I 
And one day I had to go someplace and had to fix my face, and I made another amazing discovery. If you have a beard, you can't powder your face. <laughs> And I, I saw all that powder flying around and not going where I wanted it to go. And I finally looked in the mirror and saw myself and I thought, my God, surely I'm not supposed to be growing a mustache. <laughs> and I took myself off to the doctor's office just as fast as I could get there. And while I was waiting for the doctor to come in and see this apparition I had become, I thought, well, I have two choices. I can either kill myself or I can start shaving every day. <laughs> Horrible thought. And when the doctor came in, he turned my face from side to side and he said, honey, I'm not worried about that on your face. It's caused from the hormone shots. He said, I want to know if you're growing any hair on your chest. <laughs> That's the most insulting thing anybody ever asked me in my whole life. <laughs> oh, it's anonymous. And I'd read every one of these articles just to eat them up. And I thought, I'm going to the library and research this alcoholism. In case I ever get it, I'll know what it is. <laughs> and in the library, they had two books, that millions of books in the library, they had two books on alcohol. One was a book by a man entitled, Drinking is Not the Problem, and the other was the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know which book I read first. <laughs> But anyway, when I started, when I read the big book, it said it was uh, alcoholism was a three-way illness, that it was physical, that it was spiritual, and that it was mental. And I thought, well, well, that's what's the matter with me. I haven't been to church in years. I'll go back to church, and I'll just get all right. And I went back to church, and I did start drinking on the way home from church. <clears throat> I'd go to other denominations, and I kept drinking. And that wasn't working, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Now, I had been, uh, I had been going to, uh, incidentally, the only weekend my husband was out of town in all of our drinking, I was at home, it was a cold February, and I was at home, and it was raining, and it was cold, and uh, I had been drinking in the back all day, and the boys had been entertaining themselves. They couldn't play outside. And I got, I, when I finally came to enough with such a guilty conscience, I thought, I'll fix those boys something good to eat. And I went in the kitchen to fix them something, and I took an egg out of the icebox, and I dropped it on the floor. And I took another egg out of the icebox, and I dropped it on the floor. And I looked at those two eggs splattered all over the kitchen floor, and I told myself, I am too drunk to cook. I'll drive the boys to the drive-in. I wasn't too drunk to drive. <sighs> and coming back from the drive-in, I missed my own driveway and got stuck in the ditch. And it was wet. And the more I tried to get out of that ditch, the more deeper my car went in that ditch. The boys started running next door when I started raving and ranting. Now, I lived on a dead-end street and there were four other families on this street, and our children played together and went to school together, and uh, I took them. None of those women could drive. I, I took them to school every day and picked them up. And uh, but one of these women, uh, I liked these women pretty good when I was sober, but when I was drunk, I just couldn't stand them. But one of them told me real primly that she'd never had a drink in her life. You know? You know, I don't trust somebody that's never had a drink in their life. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Well, anyway, I got out of my car in a loud, screaming voice because it was all their fault I was stuck. 
And I called these women. I started cursing them. I called them everything I could think of in the books. And when I was drunk and in a rage, I had the vocabulary of a mule skinner. And then came the God. Oh, I went to the, the all the, it rained in, the front door was open, the back door was open. Went to close the back door and I saw the eggs scattered all over the floor. And I thought, oh my God. I went to the front door and saw my car in the ditch and I said, two, oh my gods. And this was the first time my drinking had gone outside the confines of my house and backyard in many years because my husband had refused to take me out publicly a couple of years earlier than that because I always more, more or less caused a scene every time. And he brought me home one night from something. I think he pulled me out of there by the ear. And he sat me down on the bed and he said, Daughter, I'll never take you out in public again because you're going to get me killed. And you know, he didn't take me out in public because I'd been sober almost three years. And, uh, this reception. So, uh, several of the doctors I had made the rounds of the doctors had suggested that perhaps a psychiatrist might help me. So that next morning, Monday morning, I called a psychiatrist and I saw him the next Tuesday morning and it was, and I was there, it was my birthday and I was 32 years old. And I had planned a lot of this psychiatrist because I wanted some help so bad. And then, but I, I decided, no, I'll just lay it all out. I just, I've got to have some help. And I told this psychiatrist everything I could think of about me. I told him about my everything. I, I didn't leave a stone unturned. And he made a decision to put me in Herman Hospital to take a series of insulin shock treatments. He wanted me to take 60, but we couldn't afford but 30. We couldn't really afford those. We had to borrow money from my mother to get me out of the hospital. And uh, so I stayed in the hospital 30 days, and these shock treatments are brutal. They are just horrible. But if this was a price I had to pay to get well, I was willing to pay any price. And every morning they'd come in and give me a, sh a shot and put me into a coma. And then when, they brought, when they'd bring me out of it, the whole bed, everything would just be ringing wet. I just like somebody had thrown water all over me. But here again, I was willing to pay the price. And I'd been in there about three weeks when the psychiatrist came in and told me he had some real good news for me, that I didn't have anything to worry about. I was not an alcoholic. You know, I wasn't happy with this diagnosis, but it was the only one I had. And so I came home from the hospital, I gained 20 pounds, had to borrow clothes to get home on. And any, after that, any time anyone said anything about my drinking, I'd say, the psychiatrist said I wasn't an alcoholic, and surely he's right. And I just kept getting sicker and sicker, and I didn't know what I was going to do. But one of the doctors working with, uh, after that, I tried psychologists, I tried chiropractors, I tried faith healers, I tried hypnotists. I would have embraced any creed or any cult to have gotten well, and nothing was working. But one of the doctors working with my medical, one of the psychologists working with my medical doctor put me on the drug antibuse. And the last six years of my drinking, I stayed sober two to six weeks off antibuse, I'd go back to drinking and I would drink two to six weeks and it was a hell of a way to live. In 1962, I had to go to Wichita Falls, Texas to a wedding and I went up there full of antibuse because I sure didn't want to drink wrong, uh, among all the kid folks. And at the reception after this wedding, I was visiting with an aunt from another city and I turned to walk away from Aunt Sydney, and she called out to me. She said, Mary, by the way, said, your cousin Gloria is moving to Houston. 
says she's in AA now and she's just doing beautifully. When Aunt Sydney called these words out to me, a hush fell over that room. There were several hundred people in this reception. It got so quiet you could have heard a pin drop. And in that moment of hush, something way deep inside of me said, I am going to be saved. I was given the knowledge some, that somehow, through Gloria and AA, I was going to be made whole again. You would think, Mama, after I'd been traveling up all these blind alleys, that I'd come back to Houston, get in touch with Gloria, and get in AA, and everything just be roses. But that's not the way it works. I still had some more drinking to do. But I did finally get in touch with Gloria, and within two minutes after talking to me, she said, Well, Mary, you are an alcoholic. And I remember the relief I felt when she had put a name to what was wrong with me, because none of the doctors had done that. But of course, they didn't have all the information either. You know, it's kind of hard for the doctor to help you when you're lying in your teeth. And. Um, she talked to me for 13 months before she could get me to my first AA meeting. And in that 13 months, she would tell me all she could about alcoholism. She told me it was incurable, it was progressive, and it terminates fatally. She just scared me to death. And she says, as an alcoholic, you just have three choices. You can get locked up, covered up, or sobered up. That's enough to get you drunk right there. And I would protest, and I'd say, well, Gloria, I've never been in jail. I've never been involved in an automobile wreck. I've never been in a mental institution. All those shock treatments didn't count. Incidentally, I figured it up to the best of my knowledge. I had about 75 shock treatments before I got to AA. And, um, but anyway, our youngest son went away to school, I think, 1963. And this was the first time in all of my drinking, the oldest son had gone off five years earlier. And this was the first time in my drinking that I didn't have somebody to come in and monitor me. Of course, they had to come in and monitor Mother. They couldn't ask their little friends to come in the yard and play if Mother was going to get up and get the gun and shoot everybody. You know, they had to do it. And, but I was so relieved to not have somebody peeping in on me that I started drinking and I drank for three solid weeks without stopping. And I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And uh, it was during this period that I tried to commit suicide in a blackout. Now this terrified me. It, I also took the attitude, if I was going to kill myself, I wanted to know about it. I didn't want to wake up someplace dead, some, you know, someday. And um, I lost my place again. <laughs> well, I don't know what's the matter with me. We're not supposed to be letter perfect up here. And uh, oh, and this is when I got on the telephone and I called Gloria, and I said, Gloria, I need help. She said, yes, honey, I know you do. We have been fooling about, around about this long enough. And that was the night that Gloria Lee came and made a 12-step call on me and my husband. And I had been drinking for three or four days in, in the same pajamas. I hadn't combed my hair, and I didn't feel, I didn't have the energy to it. And when they knocked on the door that night, and I opened, oh, they were the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. First of all, they were clean, <laughs> they were healthy, they were smiling, they were sober, and whatever it was they had, I wanted. And we were visiting in the den, and Lee got caught my attention, and he said, Mary, if you could be given one wish tonight above all others, what would you ask for? And without a moment's hesitation, I said, I want peace of mind. He said, you want serenity? And I said, oh, yes. You know, we're told in the promises we will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. 
And I started in AA. And uh, I stayed sober 90 days. On December the 23rd, 1963, I was supposed to go to the Travis Club and get my 90-day chip. Now, my husband had come in AA to get me sober so I wouldn't be sick and drunk all the time, and then he was going on about his drinking. And incidentally, I also wanted Gloria to keep me sober over the telephone, and he said, honey, it doesn't work that way. And um, so I, my mother-in-law came to see us two or three days before December the 23rd, and she's enough to get anybody drunk. I'll tell you more about her later. <laughs> and uh, my husband came in that night. He'd been sober 90 days too, and he had a fifth of whiskey under each arm. And I, I don't remember to this day starting to drink, but when I saw those two fifths of whiskey under each arm, I went into an instant blackout, and I started drinking in this blackout, and I woke up Christmas Eve alcohol all over the house, smelling of everything, drunk, sick, hungover, and it was the first Christmas my little grandson had come to spend Christmas with grandmother, and grandmother was drunk. But I got through Christmas Day on two beers, and after my company had left, I started drinking the next day, and I'd had a couple of beers, and the telephone rang. And all he said was, Mary, I will be out tonight. And Gloria was out of town. And Lee came out that night, and I started back in AA. And I stayed sober 108 days. And I don't ever, and I started drinking again, and I don't ever, ever want to forget that last sober enough. That was the most horrible day of my life. I felt like if I turned around and looked over my shoulder, there'd be a big gorilla and he was going to eat me alive. Now, my husband had to work that day, and he had to teach school that night. He taught blueprint reading at the apprentice school, and uh, Gloria stayed in touch with me all day. And she'd say, honey, hang on. Honey, don't drink. And, some, and I was walking all through the house, and somehow I got the knowledge that if I started drinking that day, I would never sober up again the longest day I lived. Somehow that knowledge was given to me, and somehow I hung on. And Gloria got in that night, and she couldn't find anybody to come get me. And I wasn't able to drive to an AA meeting. But she finally got on the telephone and she said, Mary, you have to get to an AA meeting tonight. She said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. She said, you're going in your bedroom and you're going to get down on your knees and you're going to ask God to give you the strength to get to an AA meeting tonight. And she added one more sentence. She said, and God will give you this strength. And I went in my bedroom and I knelt down on my knees, and all I said was, Dear God, give me the strength to get to an AA meeting tonight. Now, I didn't know that when I knelt in the first sincere prayer of my entire life, that that was the moment that God started healing this shattered woman. Because from the time I rose from my knees, I have never had the compulsion to drink. The miracle happened when I was on my knees. And this time when I started back in AA, I decided I better start obeying. And whatever they told me to do, I was willing to do. I'm, I, had a, I discovered a ter terrible defect of mine. I had been drinking so long and I was so sick that I was unable to give love to you, to anybody. I was just dead inside. And everybody in AA was loving me and wanting the best for me, and I almost reached the point where I couldn't even stand you. And I worried so about this deadness inside of me. And I read someplace about a man in California that felt just like I did. He was so dead inside that he couldn't give love to anyone. 
and he started saying a prayer he borrowed from someone in AA, and I borrowed it from him. And every night when I'd go to bed, I would say, Dear God, give me a small love to give, a small understanding, and a small love of which I might be worthy. Now, I don't have to tell you this prayer has been answered thousands and thousands of times over. I didn't know who this guy was that was keeping me sober. This God of my, the God of my childhood wasn't the one I wanted in AA. And I kept fretting and worrying because I couldn't find God. I just stewed around about it and griped about it. One day I called Gloria and I said, Gloria, where in the hell is God? And she said, just keep searching. Well, I, in, in my readings, I came across this, this uh, old-time philosopher named Pascal, P-A-S-C-A-L. And all it said at the bottom of a page, limbed in black, was, Fret not thyself. If you had not found me, you would not seek me. And this went right straight to my heart. Fret not thyself. If you had not found me, you would not seek me. And I thought, you know, if this old guy is right, and I think he is, I've already found God. So I closed up all my books. And this is when I started letting God in AA and you people heal me. And uh, 28 days after I took my last drink, my husband came into AA for his sake. And he was sober. 32 years, last May the 19th. Thank you. He would like that. You know, my husband is a fisherman. He's a fishing nut. He's a fishing addict. He was. And every time we got some vacation in time, I didn't get to see the hills of Rome or the Eiffel Tower, London Bridge or anything like that. I got to go fishing. <laughs> We'd been sober about five years and we out fishing and we'd been fishing for three days and he had just beat the socks off of me. And I ain't a good loser. And uh, the fourth day, he said, Honey, are you going to go fishing with me in the morning? And I said, Nope. i find something better to do than that. And so I opened the gate the next morning and let him drive, pull the boat out. And he stopped and he said, You sure you don't want to go fishing with me? And I said, Yeah, wait just a minute. And I ran in to get this old disreputable fishing hat. And I knelt down real fast by the side of my bed. And I said, Now, dear God, protect my house from tigers, and let me beat the gnar-catching fish. <laughs> and we were out there fishing, and <laughs> I had him beat, and I said, Lenar, let's go. And he wasn't ready to go. We fished a little bit longer, and he was about, <laughs> he was about to catch up with me, and I said, Lenar, let's go. No, he said, I've at least got to get even with you. I might even beat you. And I said, just forget about that, boy. You don't have a prayer. He looked at me. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, when I said my prayers this morning, I asked God to let me beat you catching fish. He gave me the dirtiest look. <laughs> he took his hat off and threw it in the boat. And he said, now, Mary, by God, that is dirty poo. <laughs> anyway, after the Lenore would come in AA, they would, people would walk up to me and they'd say, Mary, it must just be wonderful. You and Lenore are both in AA. Well, you can just have your own AA meeting. <laughs> you know, I wanted to punch them out. We can't, we can't even agree on the preamble. <laughs> but that's all right. He worked his, his way, and I worked mine, mine. And uh, I have a favorite story I like to sometimes tell on this about the little girl. They asked her what she wanted for her birthday. 
she said she wanted a magic wand and she wanted one that worked. Well, that's what I found in AA. I have found a magic wand and I have found one that worked. But I love my AA life. I love sponsoring women. I still sponsor women and I love going to meetings and I just love everything about it. And um, I'm going to tell about my picture, then I'm going to close. Uh, when I was drinking, I didn't care anything in this world about material things. China, things like that didn't mean anything to me. And I'd been sober a little while, and a friend called me from Wichita Falls and wanted to come to Houston and pick out Crystal in China. And I said, sure, come on, but I've been real sick, and I had been. It took me over two years to recuperate even a little bit for the damage I had done with the pills and alcohol. And uh, so when Virginia came down, I took her to a brand new fancy store, it was a, and I took her to the Crystal in China department, and I said, now you just shop all you want to. I'm going back in the furniture department, sit down and just rest, because I wasn't able to stand up and talk and shop. And uh, as I turned to walk away, to go to the furniture department, there was a picture at the back of the room, and it's just about as far as from here to that back wall. It was a picture of roses, and it was the most beautiful picture I have ever seen. And I was drawn to that picture just like a magnet. I just loved that picture. And the closer I got to it, the more beautiful it became. And when I got up to it and looked at the price tag, it was $139. Lord, we couldn't afford $139 then. And, um, but it didn't make any difference that I couldn't afford that picture. The important thing was I could walk something again. It was so important that I could walk something again. And one, one day I had to go into a department store for something, and as I walked in the door, there was a mannequin there with a black and white check tacked a raincoat on it. And I wanted that raincoat. That was the second thing I had seen that I wanted. And I looked at the price tag on it and it was nine ninety five. Well I could afford nine ninety five and this is just wonderful. I had found something I wanted and something I could afford to buy. And it was way too big for me, but that didn't make any difference. It had a line in it, and when I got home, I started hemming it up on the bottom and hemming it up in the sleeves. And just as quick as I got that raincoat hemmed up, I looked outside. I wanted it to start raining right then. You know, I didn't think it was ever going to rain in Houston. But one morning, I heard a little pitter-patter of rain one afternoon and one night. And I put my new raincoat on, and I jumped in my car, and I drove to Travers, just as happy as a lark. I was singing every step of the way. And when I got to the Travers group, Travers Club, I opened the door to get out, and I saw how hard it was raining. Oh, it was just a deluge of rain. And I got back in the car and slammed the door, and I thought, my word, I had been waiting three weeks to wear my new raincoat and I didn't want to get it wet. <laughs> the other day, a, a beautiful young girl, maybe 21 years old, got up and got a 30-day, uh, she had been sober 30 days, and she was so overcome with emotion with her 30 days of sobriety, she looked at all of us and she said, I think all of you are just incredible in AA. And I'm going to close tonight by telling you, I think all of you are just incredible. Thank you.